UC, we are fortunate to have four experienced professionals, educators, and a former representative of the State of Israel. I'm going to present three questions, one at a time, to each of the panelists, followed by a Q&A session. Question number one, what is the importance of developing a connection to Israel among the young generation? We will start with you, Amir. What is the significance that the State of Israel see in developing and strengthening the connection to Israel among young generation, Jewish Americans, and Israelis living in America? Uh, well, for this question, I think it's, uh, it goes without saying that Israel must be part of um, both the American Jewish community and the Israelis. Uh, for, of course, first generation is very easy. Second generation, second generation, it's a little bit more difficult. But then I think the the trouble starts with the, the second generation having their own kids, and um, and with the we, we, we see in the uh, in the American Jewish community as well, as we go uh, far and far from the generation that was involved or knew about the Holocaust to the second and the third generation, we see less and less uh, families connected to Israel, uh, connected to their uh, Jewish identity. And Israel has to be part of that, uh, of these families and, and, and both the Israeli families in order to, to be the, this grain that around it, they can uh, also relate to their Jewish identity. Um, and when I speak about Israel, I don't speak necessarily about being involved in Israeli politics or discussing Israel as a political issue, uh, which unfortunately in the last few years is, is driving away many people from Israel. I, I'm talking about Israel as a concept, Israel as a land of opportunities for young Jews and young Israeli living here. Um, We've seen how Taglit has made a great difference in many lives. Uh, Taglit has proved to be not only an eye-opener for all these young people going to Israel, but also uh, the statistics that now has, has been gathered after Taglit. Uh, we see less and less uh, Taglit uh, alumni uh, marrying non-Jews. We see um, more and more Taglit uh, people, uh, people that had this opportunity are much more connected and we see them more active on campus later on and Israel becomes part of their lives in the in the long term. So there's no doubt that bringing Israel in any context that is relevant and uh, connecting the families and the younger generation to Israel and especially to the, uh, to the fun and the uh, positive sides of Israel. Um, this, uh, this can be uh, a crucial element in, in maintaining this relationship. And later on, we'll, I'll elaborate a little bit more about uh, how I see maybe some of the solutions to how to do that. Thank you, Amir. Moving on to Ricky, I would like to ask, how does uh, the Schechter School sees the importance of Israel education for, uh, for the young age children? So um, I think as educators in Jewish day schools, our commitment to Israel, to Israel education, is such an integral part of our lives. It's hard for us to think of it almost as a separate entity. Um, Hebrew awareness of what's going on in Israel, Israeli culture, is just such a part of the fabric of our institution and the institutions of most Jewish day schools. Um, we consider it to be just um, a necessity. We see it as our responsibility to teach our children, um, to give them a sense of continuity. Um, I think that this notion that we have generations of children walking through our doors who have no sense of a world without the st state of Israel um, s simply makes it even more um, in, you know, compelling for us to really um, forge that connection. So it's that connection with Israel, it's that sense of continuity, and I think it's that sense that we are giving them a gift, a tremendous gift that makes them a part of um, a very special 
um, and unique world, so that when they go anywhere, you speak Hebrew, you connect with another Jew, another Israeli, you have a sense of Israel, whether it's a tefillah, or a prayer for the state, or for someone who is sick. Those are things that we just kind of want to ingrain in our students so that they have this connectivity. Um, our eighth grade students go to Israel for two plus weeks before they graduate. They actually now are also stopping in Poland for a very, very brief stop in Poland for about six hours, believe it or not. Um, and then we'll go from there straight on to Israel. And those two weeks that they spend in Israel, we know, because we've heard them come back and tell us, we know that they somehow culminate those hopefully eight plus years of education. Obviously our curriculum is, you know, I don't want to say is driven by, but our curriculum is, supports their trip and vice versa, so that they're, whether they're learning something in their Tanakh, in their biblical studies, whether they're learning it um, in their Jewish history classes, the whole idea is that when they go, they have an experience that really speaks to them. Um, we want them to connect with kids there, so we take them there and they can speak to them in Hebrew. may not be fluent Hebrew, but they can make themselves understood and they can order a falafel just like, you know, someone else on the street. Um, we even tell them, you know, we teach them a little bit about how, you know, how to handle a little bit because it's an important thing to be able to do. We want them to have a cultural sense. So that connection with Israel um, is something that we hope that from the very, very get-go that we are giving them. Um, and we really believe that we're starting off by giving them a piece of a gift that we hope will simply become larger and larger as they move on in life. Beautiful. Thank you, Ricky. Uh, Bess, what is your take on the importance of Israel education? And what is the place it takes in your curriculum, designed especially for a supplementary Hebrew, Hebrew high school? So um, Israel is really a huge part, I think, of any Jewish education. Can you hear me? Is this loud in the back? Um, as, uh, it's just a central space of Jewish identity. So I think that it's, it's something that really needs to be uh, we need to educate our children for Israel. We need to do it all the time. And it is especially difficult, I have to, I have to say. I mean, in a, in a day school, like Ricky was talking about, it really infuses the institution. And we do our best as well uh, in the Sunday school to make sure that it comes out. Uh, and we do that in many different ways. Um, and I was thinking about it. I was thinking about, you know, what are the places that we um, bring Jewish, uh, Israel education to our students? And I thought of five different ways that we do it. So first of all, uh, as a Hebrew high school, it's really important for teenagers to have choice and feel like they have agency in their education. Um, so they come to us once a week and they get to choose the courses. We have two semesters and each semester they choose the courses that li they'd like to take. So what we do is every semester we make sure that there are classes on Israel and it's not just about politics as Amir was saying as well, it's, it's about culture, it's about um, pop culture, it's about um, you know, the arts, all, all different kinds of ways of connecting to Israel, also Hebrew education as well. Um, so they get to choose how they want to connect uh, and where they're going to connect. Now that, of course, is not enough, because you'll say to me, oh, but Bess, you just said you'd let them choose. What if they choose not to take a class on Israel? And that happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there are other ways that we connect as well. How do we connect them? We do a special assembly programs throughout the year. We started off the year actually uh, talking about what went on over the summer, last summer. Uh, so we had a special assembly taking place within the course of the, of the day. Uh, they still had their regular three classes. Um, we also have dedicated days of learning about Israel. So for example, just yesterday, we had Sunday school yesterday, and we had a very special day. We only ran one period of classes. And the rest of the morning, um, two and a half hours, we had a very special program. We, uh, we partner with a lot of institutions. We partnered with the JCRC. We partnered with uh, the JCC uh, on the Palisades, uh, BBYO, and other organizations to bring a day of learning about Israel to our students. And just to, I, I, I want to, if you don't mind, I'm going to read to you just a very short little uh, feedback that I got from, uh, one, I actually got interesting feedback from a lot of my students, but one of my students who's in ninth grade, she said, um, she has a Hebrew, uh, went to Hebrew school her whole life. She's in ninth grade now. She comes to us. It's her second year in the program. And she wrote, this was honestly such an amazing thing to be part of. It changed my views on Israel and has encouraged me to really persuade my mother to let me visit Israel in the near future and travel and explore every aspect of Israel from the top to the bottom. Isn't that amazing? 
from a two and a half hour program, and it was about the culture of Israel. We looked at um, food and culture, innovations, diversity, Israel on campus. So we were looking at Israel from different ways, really not politically. We didn't bring up one thing about politics. And it changed this girl's view on Israel in two and a half hours. So we can really make a difference. You know, some people say, oh, it's a Sunday school. Yes, it's a Sunday school, and we make a real difference in the lives of these teens, which is very exciting. Um, we also do after school options. We bring in speakers, and we offer to both the students and the parents to come and hear different things. Of course, that's, you know, they get to decide whether or not to come. Uh, but the real, I, I want to tell you a little bit about our flagship program, which is a leadership program. Um, and it's 10th and 11th graders throughout the entire community are invited to join. And they can be in day school as well, in high school, day school, uh, or part of our program, or non -conne not connected at all to a Jewish education in, in 10th and 11th grade. They learn how to be a Jewish leader. And what we do is we connect them with a group of teens in Israel, in Naharia. Naharia is our twin city here in Bergen County. Uh, and it is, we're in our third year of doing it this year, and it is unbelievably powerful what these children get out of this experience, not just about being a Jewish leader, which of course is you know, the, the curriculum, right? But about meeting teens in Israel, uh, the, the, they're paired with a cohort in Israel, um, spending time with them first through Facebook and through Skyping, and then meeting one another through delegations. We, we go there for a week, they come here for a week. Um, it's awesome. I can't even say enough about it, really awesome. Um, really enables them to uh, look at Israel in a different way um, and really connect. So that's a few ways that we at BCHSJS and Hebrew High uh, do Israeli as education and how we impact uh, our students. It's beautiful how we can make a difference even in a, either in a day school or in a, a very short time once in a week that you have. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Beth. Aya. As an Israeli um, that's raising children in America and as a professional that focuses on developing programs to the Israeli community, how do you see the importance of the connection to Israel? Uh, so as you said, I have you know, my personal, uh, the, the way I see the, the importance for me personally and then professionally in terms of the community. So obviously personally working with um, a lot of uh, parents to second generation Israelis, we uh, know that we have a problem uh, that we haven't, uh, we haven't had the chance to learn from professionals in the Jewish community, which is how do you transfer, how do you um, pass on uh, identity and, and heritage in a way that you know, a lot of, of Jewish uh, community institutions know how to do it, we as Israelis, uh, a lot of time face uh, a challenge. So personally, uh, for my kids uh, and, and for the kids of, of the parents around me, we want our children to be connected the way we were connected in, in a way that is uh, very emotional. And it's very hard to do when you are far away and the environment is not the same as the one we uh, grew up in. And then in terms of uh, professionally and in terms of the community, we also see differences in the way uh, we support Israel. And even if, if it is political, even if it is, you know, during the summer, uh, when, when we went uh, to, um, to, to different protests, we, we saw that it's mainly first generation Israelis um, and, and Americans who, who went to those uh, protests. And a lot of our teens and, and kids who grew up here don't feel the same obligation that we feel because we lived in Israel or that some Jewish American feel because they were really educated. Um, and, and we handle it in, in many different ways. One of them is that we have a Hebrew language and Israeli culture program. It's called uh, EMEC. Um, and it's actually an acronym in Hebrew uh, for Hebrew um, tradition and community. Uh, what we are trying to bring to the kids is uh, more than just the Hebrew language. A lot of, uh, a lot of Israeli parents and, uh, are focusing on Hebrew, spoken Hebrew. But the problem with spoken Hebrew is that it doesn't allow our children to connect um, 
in a personal way. So the connection is always through the parents and through the fact that the parents are speaking Hebrew. We want to bring um, a different connection. And um, I think what is very uh, different in our program is that it's open to, to native Hebrew speaker and speakers and non-native Hebrew speakers. And we connect them uh, with our sister city, Naria, and we bring our kids um, to different programs. So our uh, Tzofim program was actually in, in your program uh, yesterday and brought falafel and brought uh, Tzofim activities to... Tzofim is the Tzofim is the Israeli scouts. Um, so this is uh, just a, a touch of the things that we do in order to connect second generation Israelis and to bring Israel to our community to make sure that um, we bring our own added value to the community. Thank you. Moving on to question two, Michael Douglas celebrated his son Bar Mitzvah through a trip in, to Israel a few weeks ago. He had, a few weeks ago, he had awarded the second ever $1 million Genesis Prize for his commitment to Judaism and to the state of Israel. In his speech, he said, I share this award with my family, who encouraged me in my exploration of the Jewish faith. I hope these teachings and values will be a part of the legacy that I leave for my children and those who follow. Michael Doug Douglas' words serve as a good example of the significance of parental involvement. This takes us to the, the importance of the integration between parental involvement and formal or informal education. The second question to our panelists will be, how do you create, how do you, we create this synergy of parents and educators working together to build a, and and strengthen the connection to Israel? And how can we empower our children? Amir, how do you see this synergy? Well, no doubt this is a great challenge, especially when we know that the costs of uh, day schools and, and camps are very high and not everybody can afford and that it becomes a, a barrier for many families. Uh, Israelis and, and, and American Jews uh, they choose not to do that and choose to send the kids to regular public schools or and they don't go to these camps and that's one thing that prevents them from having the experience and connecting them through this uh, activity. So maybe uh, making these uh, more affordable, this has to do with the, the community itself, it has to do with the Israeli community organizing itself and, and making sure that they are enabling more and more people to participate in, in in uh, official or more uh, constructed uh, infrastructures to get this kind of uh, Hebrew, Israel activities and so on. Uh, but it all starts probably, uh, I know it from my own experience, uh, living abroad for so many years with and raising kids in so many places. It all starts at home and you have to be, uh, first of all, willing to invest and to put it as a priority and money-wise and also time-wise and to make sure that it's uh, some it's it's it one it's a part of your um, education and if it's important for you and and maybe for Israeli families it's a little bit more easy since they have family in Israel and the contacts are a little bit more easy to to establish but for for Americans that don't have this it takes much more efforts and they have to find the ways to connect to the to those programs that exist and to find a way how to bring Israel into their lives. And uh, I think uh, Taglit has made a great uh, change here as well, but this is only for the older uh, kids. What happens when the kids are young and you, have, you can't wait till they will be eligible to go on a Taglit on a birthright trip? And then we have to find all those uh, supplement programs that would be, enable them to be exposed and to start from an early age. Uh, this exposure to what is Israel all about and why is it relevant for them. Um, that's why we should present Israel in a way that is, uh, first of all, they would have curiosity. They would like to know more about it. Not just that land of the Bible or 
if they listen to the, the, the news and the politics, something that is, would be relevant for them. And there, everybody can find his own relevance, uh, whether it's sports, it's culture, it's food, uh, even the religious uh, can be a, religion can be a relevance. And, and that's, uh, that's a task that the, the, the families have to take uh, and to put some efforts in it. Um, I think that in the long run, one of the uh, options to in empower both the communities here, the Jewish communities and the Israelis uh, that already have here the center of their life, and it's the second and the third generation living here and becoming what is called today American Israelis, which is a new concept that wasn't very familiar for many a few years ago, is how we bring those two communities together. Um, for many years, the Israeli society and also the establishment was looking uh, on the Israelis abroad, and especially in the United States, uh, not in the best uh, positive uh, image. And uh, there were, the concept was our main task is to make them, make them return to Israel. And I think that today we're in a different position. Both the Israeli society has matured, and the establishment has followed that trend as well. And people don't look at the Israelis abroad as only a society that should be brought back to Israel. Uh, people are much more, uh, with much more uh, sophisticated uh, approach to, to the whole concept. And the challenge today is how to make the Israelis that live abroad, and now we're talking about the United States, we have a huge community uh, all over, how to bring them to be more connected to the Jewish communities here, how to make this connection beneficial for both sides, and it can be. It can be very, ben uh, and it's not easy. It's not easy, there's a lot of difference of mentality, difference of uh, culture, and uh, it's not easy. But this is the, the real challenge, how to make these two communities more, um, the synergy better and to make them working together and each community can enrich the other. As we heard here um, on many, many issues, the Jewish community in the United States can teach the Israelis a lot and vice versa. And this is the challenge and this is maybe the, also the, the way out of this problem. Thank you, Amir. This is a big challenge uh, trying to uh, connect these two communities and there is a lot, as you say, uh, a lot to do about it. Um, moving on to you, Ricky, and going back to the synergy um, we mentioned before about how do you in Schechter uh, see and work on this synergy of working together as educators with the parents and the parental involvement? So I think in many ways, I kind of live in a bit of a Gan Eden, a Garden of Eden, in that we are a Jewish day school and that we have our kids with us from 8 o'clock in the morning until at least 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Half a day they are studying in English and half a day they're studying in Hebrew, um, at least through fifth grade. And then I would say maybe it's a 60-40 kind of split, maybe approximately. Um, we have a huge percentage of, um, of children in our school who come from either Israeli, both parents are Israeli, one parent is Israeli, grandparents are Israeli. Um, we, every year, take kids who arrive some, at some point in August and walk into our hallways not speaking a word of English, um, and they feel right at home, and um, it really doesn't take them very long to kind of be absorbed into the culture of our institution. Um, my entire, I would say minus one or two, my entire faculty that work with me are Israelis. Um, so um, in many ways, just walking into the door of our building, you are bringing together both worlds. What I would say is that um, we're a people that's always cherished education. Education has gotten us to where we are today. As Emil just said, unfortunately, Jewish education, private education, costs a huge amount of money. That, I'm glad to say, is a problem that I'm leaving to other people to solve, although it impacts my day every single day um, in trying to keep families with us and help sustain those families. Um, I think that there's a whole other panel conversation about how we help people um, learn to accept 
tuition assistance and come to us and say, this is the education that I want for my child, because I think that you will find in very few Jewish, edu in very few Jewish institutions will they be turned away. We will work with families to make it work. Um, but that said, I think that um, if anything, of other members of the panel, I would say that we have the easiest job. Um, we have families that are committed to their kids getting a Jewish-Israeli education, developing and maintaining their identity. They're with us during the day. They are many of them going to different synagogues um, over, you know, Shabbat. Are going to Tzofim to Israeli scouts on, you know, over the weekend. They are going to the JCC where they're hanging out with other Hebrew speakers. They're going to, you know, Hebrew high school afterwards. That, you know, these are kids and for the most part families that are very, very connected. Um, and I think that for the most part, parents have chosen to send their kids to us because they so value and want to maintain that connection. Um, so I think it, it becomes our responsibility to really make that happen. Um, the one thing I will say that is a huge piece of our lives at Shechter, um, and I think a very important piece of that, of that connection, is the entire chesed staka tikkun olam, our responsibility to repair the world piece, um, and educating an entire generation of kids that they have a commitment. So this week, or last week I should say, we celebrated Tu Bishvat, and our kids were both collecting money for the JNF, learning about water preservation in Israel, while collecting clothes for people in Edgewater who had suffered through the fire a couple of weeks ago. And they understand that this month's Midat HaChodesh, this month's value of the month, is repairing the world. We're talking about recycling. We had someone from the JNF come and speak to them. They're collecting those funds. They're learning about statistics on Israel, you know, is the country that recycles 77% of its water, and the second country in the world is Spain at, I believe, 17%, and America at approximately two. So we want our kids to know those statistics and be proud of that and learn those facts. At the same time, they have a responsibility to their local kihila, to their local community. So I think that those chesed pieces and how we try and teach our kids about their responsibility to take care of Israel, to take care of their local communities, those pieces are a huge component that become very much an active part you know, of our lives, I think. Yes, um, we hear that actually it sounds like it's much more easier to engage the parents that are coming to Hebrew school because, uh, to, to a day, Jewish day school because they made a decision and made the effort. How do you see that um, in the supplementary school where parents are still engaged by bringing their children, but is there, is there, is there any extra engagement on top of just bringing them to a supplementary school? Do you succeed to create this synergy between the school, the educators, and the parents, working sure. both together, both sides together, to empower the children? So the first piece of this is that we are also lucky because I have 135 students in the school, uh, and they're from all over Bergen County. Uh, so already the parents are a self-selecting group. Uh, so they are involved, um, but I think that one of the pieces that goes in here into this question is not just about you know, day school versus supplementary school, but elementary school versus high school. And I, I, you know, as a parent, I know, and I, I, maybe you have the same experience or not, um, but as the parent of a high schooler, I'm a little less involved in my children's activities. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I see you nodding. Um, so I think that's a piece that we really need to take into account because I wouldn't expect, even if I was a full-time high school necessarily, to have the kind of involvement that I had, let's say, in my preschool. I have a preschool daughter at home. I, I'm very involved in her life and her school as opposed to my high school children, which I'm way less involved in. Um, so that's a piece I think that's really, uh, a really important. Um, but ab you know, absolutely, we do what we can. Like we do special programming for parents. Um, but you know, to take in mind, and we always do keep in mind how, how busy people's lives are, uh, especially on Sundays. Sundays, you know, people have the day off, and it's really uh, just one part of the of the weekend. So we know how difficult it is to engage um, with all of you know all of that baggage. But like you know, like Ricky, we're we're hugely you know lucky 
because we have parents who are engaged. They're sending their children. Sending their children is engagement. So that's a piece that's really important to keep in mind. Thank you. Aya, the question for you will be, um, do you find that you're dealing with Israeli families, with Israeli parents, do you find that it's taking for taken for granted that Israeli parents will be engaged with Israel education, I Israel programming, or is it something that you have to promote? Um, so I will um, I will divide my answer to to two parts. So we have, um, as I said, an after school program for Hebrew language and Israeli culture. And as Beth said, you know, send their, their, you know, their kids is, is uh, in a way, engagement. Um, however, I think that most Israeli parents who send their kids to our program are very much interested in the Hebrew aspect, in the spoken Hebrew aspect um, specifically. And then from there, I think it's our responsibility to make sure that the kids uh, want to come. A lot of Israeli kids do not uh, want uh, to come to those programs. And though the parents, you know, we expect the parents to uh, collaborate with us to make sure that they, they bring them, we always tell them, you know, it's your job to bring them to the door. Well, we need to do the rest. We need to make sure that we constantly think of um, ways to make it fun to make it interesting, to make them feel uh, connected. And I think in terms of Israel education, um, we actually have uh, maybe a tougher challenge. Because as Israelis, a lot of time we think that we know everything that we need to know about Israel. And I, I find myself you know, to doing programs uh, that are uh, mainly attended by uh, the American Jewish community. And the Israelis are not coming because, you know, what can you teach us about Israel that I don't already know? Um, so I, I think that um, the things that has to do with early childhood, you know, with Israeli experience, with stories, with songs, with theater shows, yes, but uh, education for uh, adults, um, and education and, and keeping people uh, educated about Israel and, and um, the current event in Israel, that's a tougher challenge for us. Interesting. What is the biggest challenge that we are currently facing in connecting our children to Israel, and how could uh, we address this challenge? Although you touched on many <coughs> challenges, maybe would, you would like to pick one the biggest challenge, the one that you see the biggest one, and tell us a little bit uh, more about it and how do you think you can face it? Or are you, uh, how are you facing it, Amir? Well, I'll take this to, uh, to a, lot, a different phase. We face right now, and we see it all over the US, when we go to the college <coughs> campuses, we see uh, many Israelis and American Jews as students on campus avoiding Israel, uh, avoiding the fact that they, uh, they tackle on campus uh, a lot of negative sentiments towards Israel. They, they, in many campuses today, there are uh, challenges. And we see a phenomenon that many of them just try to avoid it. They don't want to be involved. They say, we don't have enough information. We don't want to get into this discussion because we won't be able to respond. Uh, some of them just say it's too touchy, we don't want to be there. And this is something that I think we have to, to tackle in a few ways. First of all, it, it starts at early age, of course. If, if you're not involved with Israel and you don't think that Israel is part of your life, then when you go to the campus and you find those people um, lying and, and putting all these horrible uh, things about Israel, and you don't feel very say, tempted to go into the discussion and try to uh, defend Israel. Uh, another thing is uh, uh, providing them with, uh, with information so they would be able to, to, be, uh, uh, to have an intelligent discussion, intelligent 
discourse about Israel, and, but that's just the tactical point. The, the most important thing is to make them, uh, to make Israel, as, as, as I said, uh, relevant for them, and not on the political sphere, and make Israel something that they would like to know more about. And most Israeli and Jewish students are indifferent. Not that they don't just don't want to deal with the political uh, sides of, of this discourse. They're just indifferent to the whole concept. And this is, the, I would say, the most problematic challenge that we have right now. Mm -hmm. Vicky? So it's actually an interesting question. Um, so if I can just take two totally different sides to it, just to piggyback for a second on, on what Amir was speaking about. Um, my youngest is a, um, is a college freshman and spent last year um, on an interesting program in Israel and we definitely felt that we had given her the tools both between her, her own Jewish education and her trip to Israel to be able to move onto the college campuses. During her trip to Israel, she received a lot, she went through a lot of mini courses and activities on how to prepare the student for the college campus. Um, and I think, interestingly, one of the things that I feel that um, is problematic for us is not that our kids don't, not that they are missing the education and the information, at least with some of our kids, as to how to respond, but I don't think that they're prepared for the way in which some of the comments are being made at them. I don't think we've prepared them for, um, I don't want to overstate it, but for potentially a degree of hatred or a degree of anger that has come at them. We've given them the tools intellectually, um, but to be fair, we've raised them in pretty warm, comfy environments. Um, if your children have grown up in Bergen County, you can go pretty much anywhere to get kosher food. You can go pretty much anywhere and hear Hebrew and speak Hebrew. And we live in a very, very comfortable, safe, thank God world. Um, and we haven't necessarily prepared them for that aspect of the real world. We may have prepared our kids for going out at night and being careful and this is what you do and this is how you take care of yourself, both the females and the males. But we haven't prepared them. They've heard the rhetoric. They haven't necessarily heard the degree of anger that comes with it and I think that that's a piece of what pushes them back. That fortunately is not something that we are dealing with with younger kids at school, so we leave that to the high schools, or I guess to us as parents, to have to find ways to deal with. Um, I think one of the things, um, to be fair, again, for all the reasons that I stated before, we don't really have challenges at school with helping our kids connect. We have challenges and we have a responsibility to make sure that they are learning enough so that they can continue to stay connected. One thing I will say that um, we found very interesting was um, the Avichai Foundation put together a very interesting study on Israel and is Israel education um, in uh, last year, I believe, in 2014. One tiny little um, piece in the study showed that schools where predominantly schools that are religious schools, um, where prayers are said for Israel on a very regular basis, leave some of our children seeing Israel as potentially weak. I would say completely counterintuitive to every purpose that we've ever had in trying to teach our children to pray when they need to pray. And it's a teeny tiny little line, but something that really stuck with me um, and made us give some thought to what is the message that we're teaching? We teach our children that as Jews, we pray. We pray for people who are sick. We pray for people that are needy. We pray for people in times of need. Um, and what does it mean that we're creating a generation of children that recognize that we need to pray for the state of Israel? We're doing it with this sense that of wonder and comfort and community, and this is why we pray. Um, so when I read that, I brought it to my faculty, who all kind of looked at me the same way I looked at them, like, what? Um, but we have taken pause, and we've given some thought to that, and we have tried to find some ways to think about that a little bit differently when speaking to our children about the how and why. Um, we say the tefillah for Shlomam Dina, or whether or not we pray for, God forbid, a soldier who has been kidnapped, or people who are sick or in trouble. Um, it's just kind of a, something that we've thought about. 
But um, I will be joining our eighth graders on their eighth grade trip to Israel in a few weeks. And based on the conversations going on in our hallway about what we can wear and how much Israeli gum we can chew, um, and the fact that you know they are going to be eating bamba from the second they get there till they leave, um, I, I'm praying that they are very connected and that we can continue to really help them stay very connected. So, of course, I, you know, my life is teens. So I think, of course, about teens when you ask the question about challenges and what's the most pressing challenge that I see. So I think about what our teens encounter. Um, when they are watching the news, when they're on Facebook, they're encountering different narratives. That, that word is used a lot in, you know, educational jargon. Um, but particular points of view, and many of them actually are very anti-Israel. Um, so I think what's challenging for our students to understand that there are different narratives, not just negative narratives, but that we have our own narrative as a Jewish people about Israel. And I think that American children in particular, and by the way, I, I think Israeli American children, in other words, children whose parents are Israeli, are American children, they speak Hebrew and they have they have relatives in Israel, but they're American children. So our American teenagers are very concerned with being fair. Do you understand what I'm saying? They, they're very concerned with looking at all sides and weighing both sides and being fair. And, you know, maybe we shouldn't push our own agenda. You know, everyone has a point of view. And it's, I find that very challenging. And, you know, unlike when, when I grew up, and some of us are around the same age, I guess, you know, we, we, we didn't have Facebook, right? Facebook is pretty new. Um, and Facebook, you have to put yourself out there. People do put themselves out there, right? When you're on Facebook, you put your views, and some of us only put pictures of puppies or something like that, or kittens. But a lot of times, you know, when they're pressed, let's say, by peers, or when they see things online um, on Facebook that have to do with Israel that are negative or have different opinions, they're going to, and I think close to what Amir was saying a little bit, are gonna shy away from it. I don't think that it's necessarily because they're apathetic. Um, I think because to put yourself out there and promote something that a lot of your friends not just, not just, and Jewish friends too, by the way, are, are maybe being a little critical of, you know, and they may be critical as well, um, but to actually put yourself out there is challenging. It's, it's, it takes, um, takes a hefty amount of courage to do that, uh, and I think that teens are, you know, not all of them have that courage, and not all adults have that courage as well, I think, if you know what I'm saying. Um, so I think that our goal as educators of teens is to help the students leverage each other. You know, we all have different opinions. We don't all have the same opinions about Israel. But how do we get together as Jews, as, as American Jews, as Israeli Americans, or whatever, American Israelis, whatever we call ourselves, um, and find our own way in our own relationships and be able to open up that conversation and have, you know, first within ourselves that safe space to talk and, and be able to talk about what we feel about Israel and, and not feel like we're going to be pegged who wants to be pegged? You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, you're the anti, or you're the pro, or, you know, and, and people are, are nervous about that, I think, and that's a challenge. Um, so our, our goal, in other words, how do we deal with these challenges? To open up that space for a conversation, um, to be able to have them speak about it so they are prepared when they go to college. Um, just yesterday, when we had this program on Israel, we had a young man from STAM with us. He's a 19-year-old who goes to John Jay College, and he showed them a video of raw footage, um, and it was very, very impactful um, to see. And we, we, we do our best to actually expose them uh, in the teen years to these things because they need to be prepared. And while they don't have to take a stand, um, to know that it's important, it's important as a Jew, it's important in our connection to Israel to educate ourselves, and that's, uh, that's what we try to do. Uh, so I'll go back to um, one thing I said about uh, making sure that our children develop uh, their own personal connection to Israel that is independent of you know, us as their parents or their educators. And a little bit to what Amir said, 
at the beginning about developing their curiosity. So no matter how much we teach and how much we um, you know, can give materials, it's, I think, our uh, challenge dealing with um, second generation Israelis to give them the tools and to develop their curiosity so they can you know, keep, um, keep learning by themselves. Um, and for us, uh, it has to do a lot with, you know, if, if we are talking about, uh, about Hebrew education uh, and, and the Hebrew language, a lot of it has to do with the reading because we see that the kids, you know, um, they develop more or less the same uh, basic skills of reading and writing, but very quickly uh, their, their reading abilities in English will you know, be, uh, the, it will be more interesting for them to read in English because it's easier to read in English and, and as, as much as they, um, you know, get the tools of how to learn and the skills and the ability to learn and read in English, their, their ability to do that in Hebrew will decrease. There are a lot of things that, you know, their text and, and, and things that are cultural for us as Israelis that if you can't read Hebrew, then a lot of, uh, a lot of the things will get lost uh, in, in terms of what is important for us as Israeli parents to give to our kids. So for us, it's the challenge is, is that we're facing is how we keep developing the skills of our children to be able to, to be curious and to want to keep learning, um, and not just learning, but learning in Hebrew, reading in Hebrew and speaking in Hebrew and exploring um, things that has to do with identity and with Israel in Hebrew. Thank you. I think that all the challenges that were presented here uh, are, <clears throat> are in this way or another uh, connected to actually the education that we give our children and the tools that we equip them for life and for facing their challenges. And, um, and actually th the importance of being proactive and do for our children and pick the right way for them um, to educate them about Israel and to give them uh, tools to uh, face, face their, whatever they're facing uh, during their early childhood, being a young adult, being teenagers before, etc. cetera. Um, so thank you for sharing with us your insights, stands, experiences, and educational approaches. And thank you for bringing information about programs that you have um, we would like to now to invite the audience to join the conversation by presenting uh, questions and um, please. Well, I think the experience will be different in, in Europe and in, in the US. Uh, in Europe, we see some of the consequences of what happened recently in Paris, Belgium, and we see how it affects the communities there, their, their uh, <clears throat> feelings of uh, safety and security, and uh, many, many families would like to see their kids raised in, in, a, in a different atmosphere. And that causes many of the uh, communities there to be much more closed, and to think about what's, what's the, if, if there at all there is a future for, for Jews in Europe. In the US, it's a different circumstance. People look at it from, from a very safe place. Um, and uh, I, th I see now the American Jewish community, especially the organized one, very much concerned about what's going on in Europe, but not because they think it's gonna affect the, the community here. Mainly because this is now the call of the time this is what we should do. We should put all our efforts and help those, our brothers in Europe, uh, first of all, to make them safer and to see how, how we can improve the situation for the, for the longer term. Um, I'm not sure it's gonna make people like to be more identified with, with Judaism, especially when you see, in, in Europe it's a different uh, situation, but here people, it's not gonna be a very attracting a phenomena to bring people to be more identified. And we see a trend that has nothing to do with that. 
maybe because America is so safe, because it's so, such an open society, we see uh, more and more people less identifying with causes anymore. People are much more, uh, as we say, uh, in their silos, and pe the, the technology is bringing them. Technology is bringing them in one hand to be more open and, and, and to to, any, to the world, but they're very much uh, close to their own uh, cocoons in, in many ways. And this is not going to be something that I see uh, opening new channels for, for identifi identifying with Judaism or Israel. Um, it's not, it doesn't look like it's going to change that here. I agree 100%. <laughs> I see it with our own students that we, I mentioned briefly at the beginning that we do the Mifgash program where we have our leadership program here in America that's, that's partnered with the leadership program in Naharia. Um, and I just see the connections that the children make and it opens their eyes very much on both sides of the ocean, very much so. Um, that the Israelis have a, you know, that the Israeli teens have a certain image in their mind of what an American is and they get to know, you know, real life Americans and, you know, they have a much deeper understanding of what America is, what their peers in America are doing. They're not just watching them on TV, they're meeting with them and they're getting to know them. Uh, and they make this relationship that on both sides is hugely important and that's why it's so, what, y what you're saying really resonates with me. It's not just a one way street, it's definitely a two way street. But just one thing that's so interesting is that Israeli teens, um, we, we do a little, a little questionnaire on both sides, both groups. This is the third year I told you I, that we are doing this. And one of the things that comes out is their different views on what should be or what could be. One of the things that we ask them is, should all Jews serve in the Israeli army? You know, should all Jews vote? Should all Jews this? Should all Jews that? Should we all keep kosher? Should we all, you know, things like that. But what's so interesting um, is that we've seen for the third year in a row that almost all of the Israelis feel, of, co wait, of course, of course Americans, should, all Jews should serve in the Israeli army. And having that conversation with their American peers who are, are for the very, I mean, majority of them are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, well, well, you know, in Hebrew as they say. What do I have to do with the Israeli army? Um, but having that conversation, not just that conversation, but I'm just using that as an example, is, is enlightening to them. And, and we're seeing, you know, three years later, what we just started three years ago with this program, uh, the connections going on, and there, you know, we have the Israelis in the army right now from the first cohort, our Americans in college, and finishing high school, we, it's, you know, it's a two-year thing. And they're in touch, and you see it really clearly online, how they're giving each other idud, you know, how they're encouraging each other. Um, it's a wonderful thing. So I agree, I just wanted to say how much I agree with you, that it's very much a two-way street. Uh, I'll, I'll add to that um, just uh, one program that we do. We connect uh, families with, with young kids, actually, and it's called uh, The Same Moon Project. And we are connecting families from um, our uh, EMEC program with families in Naharia, and we uh, match the kids, so they are more, more or less uh, the same age, but it's, it's young kids, so they're too young to write letters to each other, so it's, it, be, it became a family project. So the family in Israel writes to a family here in New Jersey, and they exchange uh, letters in, uh, on different subjects every month. And uh, so we started in a very early age, hoping that uh, the connections will last and continue. Realizing that our school ends with eighth graders, um, Zionism is definitely a, not a dirty word for us at all. Um, we teach, so I will say, realizing that a lot of history is probably taught to children far, you know, at an earlier age than they should be learning history. Um, our middle school students, um, especially our eighth graders that go to Israel, are learning an entire Jewish history. I, I would say they have a 
pretty um, comprehensive Jewish history curriculum um, covering, I would say personally, too, ma too many years of history, um, but extensively covering um, the Shoah and um, moving them through um, you know, for Zionist Congress and getting them, you know, all the way from there, you know, to Israel from 1897 to, you know, to 48 and then 67. Um, what we do shy away from is politics. But we, which I think is true pretty much across, you know, whether, whether we're talking about the American, you know, elections or Israeli elections, whatever it might be. But we teach them a huge amount about Zionism. But to be completely fair, um, I think that there is a very loud and clear message that we're extremely proud of our students that go on to make Aliyah. And we're very proud of our students that go on to serve in the Israeli army. And we um, last week had um, a child who is the, the cousin of graduates of our school come and talk about his, you know, his choice to serve in the Israeli army. He's come back, and he's now here. But um, I think that we're very proud of that. I think what we've lost positively is we've lost this notion of those leaving Israel are uh, Yoldim. That doesn't mean that we're not proud of those who choose to go to Israel and live in Israel and make that their home. Um, if we're not teaching them that that's a wonderful thing to do, then I'm not sure, you know, if, if we're teaching them that Israel is so amazing and fantastic and that we're connected to Israel and this is, you know, our homeland. I would hope that if a percentage somewhere along the line of our graduates did not leave us, carried on in Jewish education, and some of them did not choose to make it their home, I would question whether or not at some point we're doing a good job. So yes, we do teach a lot about Zionism. I, I could. Um, well, also at Hebrew High, I mean, Zionism is absolutely not a bad word. But I think that teens have a different uh, connotation because they're hearing, like I, I alluded to before, Facebook. I spoke about Facebook and uh, and what they see online and what they see in the news and you know the anti-Zionists and does anti-Zionism equal anti-Semitism? So we actually we do a lot of education head-on about it um, from a negative point of view because we want to prepare them for what they're going to experience on the college campus, um, and we find that really very important. We have, um, I, you know, we do have a. Um, they, they get to choose the classes, right? It's a, uh, it's a curriculum that's uh, full of choices for them. There are two classes that are not a choice. One is their eighth, in eighth grade, they have one course they have to take in the first semester that bonds them, and it talks about Jewish ethics, et cetera, but it basically is to get them bonded. And in 12th grade, the last semester before they head off to college, um, or gap year, although most just go straight to college in our school, um, we do a, a preparation for college and preparation for leaving home. And a lot, there are a lot of things in that curriculum. Um, and one of them is uh, tackling what is Zionism? And is it, an, is it anti-Semitism to call yourself an anti-Zionist? So we, we do tackle that head on. Um, but I would say in general, there's not, um, certainly from the faculty, there's not a, a negative connotation whatsoever. Um, you know, as an American who made Aliyah and then made Yerida, <laughs> uh, I, I don't see myself as any less of a Zionist, personally. Um, I would say I think that families that choose to send their kids two-day school um, are committed to Israel. Um, I think many of the Israeli families that choose to send their children to our school send them there because they want them to be in an environment where their kids are hearing a lot of Hebrew. Um, some of them are interested in the religious aspects of the education. Some of them are not. They want them singing in Hebrew, speaking Hebrew, eating Israeli food, feeling every chag, having a sense that this is home. Um, and they feel that. Um, so I can't honestly say that I feel a tremendous difference um, between those families you know, that are from Israel and those that are not. Um, I think in a very classic way, 
you know, when there's a, a program going on that may be more Israel related, I might have a few more volunteers from that pool of parents than I might have for something else. So Yom Matzmaut, Israel Independence Day, you know, a lot of the members of that committee, my parent volunteers tend to be the Israeli parents who feel more comfortable with it and feel that they can make it a real Israeli experience. And for something else, I might have a more, you know, American group, you know, volunteering. But I think that the commitment is pretty loud and clear across the board. I think for us, um, you know, we, as I mentioned, we have a native Hebrew speaker uh, track, which is mainly aimed for kids with Israeli parents, and a non-native Hebrew speaker track that um, mainly is for um, kids that both of our parents are American Jews or uh, one of their parents uh, is Israeli. And uh, what the difference that I see is that those uh, American parents who, who choose to send their kids to our uh, Hebrew program, uh, usually it is because they want more Israel and less um, religion. And they think that if they will come to uh, a program that is designed, you know, that is the Israeli center program and, it, and, and is more Israeli, uh, they will get less you know, Jewish education towards this and, and they don't want to go to a Hebrew school or something like that and that is why they come to us. So I don't know if it's because of the more Israel, but it's the less um, Jewish education that they want. Our program is, is, uh, is an after school program and we always uh, think of ways, you know, how to engage more kids. Uh, the project that we are now working on is, you know, we have a very big uh, Israeli scout uh, program, and we are trying to find ways to engage those uh, kids and teens who don't go uh, to the scouts, some of them because of the language, some of them because Beth, Beth is right, and they are American uh, kids, and they do not connect as well to the Israeli scout and, and that atmosphere. So what we are trying to develop now is uh, a leadership um, um, weekend that will be only three times a year that will be in Hebrew and English that will enable kids um, that are Israeli or have Israeli backgrounds and do not go uh, to the to the they don't go to the Israeli uh, programs and they will not go to the Jewish programs. So they're somewhere in the middle and, and nobody is uh, uh, engaging them. We are trying to engage them in a way that will enable them to come with their Israeli friends or, or will, with their American friends, because there will be Hebrew, there will be English, it will be fun. Um, so definitely we're trying uh, very hard to engage more and more uh, kids and teens. We, we actually are explicit. We, we offer courses using stories, <laughs> um, both uh, through books and through, you know, we have a teacher who's done, uh, you know, just through the spoken, spoken stories. Um, so we, we, do, we attack it from that perspective, is we actually offer courses on storytelling. And also storytelling from the children's perspective, perspective. and that, that enters into classes that aren't even explicitly about storytelling, but how do we get children to be able to tell their own stories? because they need to learn how to, how to speak for themselves. And they also have their own stories. As, as teens, even young children have their own stories. They love to talk about themselves. So that's one way of getting at it as well. The, the only thing I would add is, um, so apart from just throughout the general studies courses of literature and how they look at storytelling and so for example, our fifth graders are currently involved in their heritage fair. So they've learned about artifacts and they're now telling stories about these artifacts that belong to their families. So apart from things like that in the curriculum that you'll see, when it comes just a tiny piece of what you were speaking about, which is I guess in the Hebrew language connection piece, um, one of the complexities is always finding things that kids can read stories that they can relate to at their level that are both, de that are developmentally at their level so that we're not watering down the Hebrew language to, and you know, so you've got this nine-year-old reading a babyish story that, that you know, um, which is boring them. 
Um, and very often, and one of the things we tried very hard to do is to find Hebrew language curriculum and Hebrew stories that are authentically Israeli, as opposed to programs that are written, which in, in and of itself is a whole, a whole other, very long panel. But um, but finding those materials coming out of Israel that our kids can relate to and use um, is an interesting challenge. Um, I'll add that in our program, when we talk uh, to the young kids, we use uh, a lot of classical Israeli stories um, as a way for, for us to enable uh, the, the intergeneration connection between the kids and their parents. Uh, a lot of our parents love it that the kids are learning a story that they read as, as children, and then they can talk about it with their kids at home. Um, and we also do, you know, we also use uh, other sources of media, uh, stories, and I, I said it from the beginning, I, I view reading is very important, but um, we have a lot of um, uh, online tools that we use to, um, to, tell, to tell stories to the kids, even if they can't read them, but at least they can understand them and speak about them. And with our older kids, when we, when we do have the issue of kids that um, can speak and understand better than they can read, we have a program that brings Israel through um, films. So they will see films, a lot of old Israeli films, and they will learn about Israel and about the history um, that way, about the story of, of Israel and, and the story of their parents and grandparents. Just one more thing that, that my fellow panelists reminded me of, and it's, it's important when you're talking about storytelling is, and I did say a little bit about how we encourage them to tell stories, but one thing that we found very powerful is one of my teachers started a year ago uh, to do a class she calls Jewish Parodies. So what they do, you know how you know, everyone likes to do, you know, it's very big now to do parodies on Jewish songs and et cetera. So encouraging the children to learn something either about Israel or about a holiday or something in the world today. And they put together their own little music video about it. Um, so that's enabling them to create a story uh, that they write together as a group uh, that we've just found to be super powerful. First of all, it exists, by the way. It's called uh, Abaita Israeli, and it's a representation of the Ministry of uh, Absorption <coughs> and Immigration. Um, well, I think that I, I touched upon this. Uh, there is a change in the Israeli society and, it's, and also a change in the policy of the Israeli government, not, not necessarily towards the uh, Israelis living abroad, but in the whole uh, broader uh, prospect of of uh, do we invest in uh, trying to make Aliyah, try to everybody to make Aliyah, or do we strengthen the communities where they are? And I think that the trend is now, or it has been moved to putting more emphasis on uh, giving tools and strengthening the communities and strengthening their Jewish identity, Jewish education. And that goes also for Israelis, of course. Um, so there was an initiative by the government just a few years ago, and it hasn't concluded yet, but to invest quite a lot of money in strengthening the Jewish identity in the diaspora. And that's mainly done with education. So that's a, a government investment in Jewish education abroad. Um, the concept of uh, Abaita Israeli is, is not only trying to bring the Israelis back to Israel, that's part of their job, they're also investing in uh, providing Hebrew uh, curriculum to kids, uh, all sorts of things that has to do with, have to do with education. Um, this is the trend. If you ask me if there's, need, there's a need for more, of course there's a need for more. Uh, but I think that the, the trend is towards that. Uh, there still will be projects trying to bring back Israelis to Israel uh, on various projects like bringing back scientists and trying to attract people with uh, benefits, uh, tax benefits and others in order to make their return easier. That's still gonna be part of the, 
of the work. On the same time, it's going to be strengthening and trying to improve the, the communities wherever they are. So they will be strong and they will be connected and they will be uh, able to educate their, uh, their kids and keep this identity and, and connection to Israel. I want to uh, add something to that um, about the Israeli house, about the Israeli. Um, we have, uh, we had, have our program at the JCC in, in Tenafly, but uh, there was a demand for a similar pro uh, program in, in Hoboken, New Jersey, where there, they did not have the resources that I luckily had at uh, my JCC. And, and it was to, uh, uh, thanks to a, gr uh, a grant that we received from uh, the Israeli house that we were able to create a satellite program in Hoboken for them and, and bring Hebrew uh, language and Israeli culture uh, program there. Um, and also uh, earlier this year, I was invited by the Ministry of Absorption to be a part of a think tank about the Israeli Jewish identity of Israelis uh, living in the diaspora. And they mainly uh, looked for professionals who work mainly with the Israeli community to come there. So it was a very small think tank because apparently there is not a lot of us that are Israeli and work uh, mainly with the Israeli community, but they are definitely trying and they, they had a three-day seminar just about that and how the government of Israel, where should it invest um, if they want to strengthen um, and, and preserve our connection to Israel as second generation um, Israelis. Another project that is very successful in the U.S. is, uh, is the Israeli Scouts, which is, uh, again, it's not only supported by government, it's a lot of the money is coming from the parents themselves, of course, to support it, but it's, it's one of those initiatives that is catching and, and many Israelis uh, are now involved. And that's a great opportunity because then they also have, uh, especially for those families that will not return to Israel eventually, the kids have the opportunity to experience Israel and some of them even go to serve in the army and come back here uh, through the through the, the Tzofi mo uh, movement. And that's a great opportunity for, for many Israeli kids. So uh, I think that the, um, when you get into the whole conversation about charter schools, it become, it's incredibly complex, as we know. Um, the charter school that was created in Florida um, a couple of years ago, which had, has had tremendous success and has run a, a really interesting program. But to give you a, just a, a tiny snippet of the complexity, um, the sign outside the charter school said in Hebrew, Buchima Ba'im, welcome in English. Um, that sign had to be removed because, as we know, the root of Buchim Ba'im is Baruch, which is a bracha, which is a blessing, which has a religious value. And the charter schools running under separation of church and state cannot use the word blessing in their message. So I would say that while it's a very interesting conversation to look at how we could create material for he teaching Hebrew as a second language, I, God forbid, don't want to be quoted as saying, I hope that they don't succeed. But I would say that I believe that there is an integral part of our culture and our heritage and everything about it, where it is very, very hard to tease apart every aspect of the Hebrew language, which is so incredibly rich and so incredibly magnificent, but it is entrenched in religious values or vice versa. And separating those two becomes very, very difficult. So when you start talking about looking at creating a program where you are only teaching the Hebrew language, but you have to be careful of the use of every single word that you use, it becomes you know, incredibly difficult. So there are programs that are being created and have been very successful for teaching Hebrew you know, language just as a Rosetta Stone type of you know, piece which can be amazing, and we use them in our schools for kids who join us late and haven't had four or five years. But when you talk about the public school system and creating charter schools, I think it's a whole other tier of, 
of difficulty. And to be fair, I would like to see that money put into developing Hebrew language programs for programs such as the JCC or the high schools or for us, which is where we need a greater you know, variety of programs for different kinds of learners with different needs. I, you know. Thank you so much for the panelists and for the wonderful discussion and for the audience for recognizing the importance of the topics and taking a part in this discussion. Also, thanks again to Gesher Shalom Rabbi Stern for supporting and hosting us tonight. Our goal was to open the dialogue that will be inclusive for all Americans and Israelis on a topic that concerns us all, the future of our children. Israel education takes place in many settings, as we heard, formal, informal, and experiential learning. There are many ways to connect, and it's our responsibility as parents to find the right way for our children to raise them for, for the love of Israel and to educate them about Israel. It's not only about our, our own child, it's about the future of the Jewish people. I would like to end with a quote, with a quote that, that is uh, connected to a point raised by, raised by Bess and by Aya. And it's about the, the significance of the connection between peers on both sides of the ocean. Um, Kyle, Kyle Flagel just came back, he's here with us, just came back from Israel. He joined the Taglit Birthright, connected to what Amir was talking about. Although Birthright is a program for young adults, and our conversation tonight was focused on a younger age, I thought this heartwarming testimony shows the great value of Israel education and highlights the importance of finding our own way to connect. This trip really changed my perspective on Judaism and the state of Israel. It makes me really want to start participating in Jewish culture and celebrate Jewish holidays. I've seen so many places and learned so much about Israel. Herzl really got to me. The Western Wall was the first time I really prayed. And I really had a, an emotional prayer, even though I don't believe in God. I've learned from one of the Israeli soldiers who also don't believe in God, that we don't necessarily have to pray to, our, to, to a God. We can pray to our values. I've met a lot of good friends. Seven Israeli students and soldiers joined us for five days. I've become best friends with them. Thank you, Kyle, for sharing. And I think, I think this is the power of education, connection, and relationships. Thanks again, and looking forward to see you with us in the next panels. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.